We're going to read from uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 uh, once more. Thanks. Thanks. The last time that we will read uh, from this uh, chapter. But let's uh, pray first as we come to read the word together. Father, we thank you again for your word and for all that it would encourage us to do in terms of looking to you. Uh, pray, Father, that we may find, find uh, fresh encouragement today as we consider your word together in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, that you not be quickly shaken from your composure, or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as if from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. Do you not remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you these things? And you know what restrains him now, so that in his time he will be revealed. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Then that lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth, and will bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. That is, the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders, and with all deception of wickedness for those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. For this reason God will send upon them a deluding influence, so that they will believe what is false, in order that they may all be judged who did not believe the truth, but took pleasure in wickedness. But we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. It was for this He called you through our gospel, that you may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught, whether by word of mouth or by letter from us. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who has loved us and given us eternal comfort and good hope by grace, comfort and strengthen your hearts in every good work and word. So we're considering this morning the necessity to hold and uh, to be reminded that we are held by God. Let's just review things uh, for chapter 2, really, right the way through, uh, so that we can remember the context of these words that we're considering this morning. Paul had started off by saying that, uh, really, there seemed to be false reports going around. Uh, Some were saying that a letter or word had come from the apostle that the day of the Lord had come. And And Paul points out very clearly that first there will be an apostasy, a falling away, And that the man of lawlessness, or the Antichrist, as he's sometimes called, uh, will uh, will be revealed. And he will even set himself up as God. Uh, And he will produce uh, false signs and wonders even. So that uh, there will be a great deal of deception. And many people will go after him. In fact, he will rule the world. He will be something of a world leader at that time. But on the other hand, Jesus will return and destroy him uh, by the very breath of his coming, just by his appearance, and uh, by the word of his mouth, the evil one will be destroyed. And then, of course, Jesus will reign on earth. So that's something of the sequence that we've been considering together. That First, there will be an apostasy which is already beginning to happen. And then this world leader will come and set himself up as God. But on the other hand, uh, Paul, as we were considering last week, he had spoken about those who were deceived because they didn't want to receive that love of the truth. And so they were caught up in this great delusion, which even God gave them over uh, to their own devices and their own ways. Uh, But 
here in contrast, Paul is saying, well, thank God that you're not like them. Thank God that you received the truth. Thank God that you were willing to listen. You claim that salvation. In fact, we considered uh, six things last week that are mentioned there in that passage when he's giving thanks. That first of all, they were loved by God. And that they've been called and chosen, that they had responded to that work of God. So that they knew salvation. Sorry, moved on too quickly. So that they knew salvation because they had believed the truth. And we saw how it's the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives to produce that godly life that we ought to be living. And then, of course, in the end, we would receive that glory when we were with him. Either when he returns or when we die before his return, uh, that we would go to be with him in heaven. So that's something of what we've been considering as we've been going through this chapter. And this morning I want us to particularly look at these last three verses. We might just uh, read them again so that uh, they're fresh in our minds. (coughs) So then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught whether by word or mouth or by letter from us. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who has loved us and given us eternal comfort and good hope by grace, comfort and strengthen your hearts in every good work and word. So it's uh, particularly we're thinking now, uh, well, in the first uh, instance of our response to all that God has done, that good news and that salvation How are we to go on? Because he wants to encourage them. And the first thing he says is that they need to stand firm. A fairly constant refrain really in scripture, particularly in Ephesians. In Ephesians 6 where it talks about putting on the whole armour of God. That we might be able to stand in the evil day. And that is important because if we're not fully equipped, we can so easily succumb to the attacks of the evil one. There in uh, verse 11 he says, put on the full arm of God, so that you will be able to stand, against, uh, stand firm against the schemes of the devil. We're very much aware that we're in a battle. In fact, this chapter in 2 Corinthians shows just part of that battle at the end time. That this deceiver will come, trying to get the whole world to follow him. He is actually attempting... To get the kingdom before Jesus can have his kingdom. He knows that his days are short. And so he tries his very best to deceive all that he can. And again we have therefore take up the full armour of God. That you will be able to resist in the evil day. And having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm therefore. Having girded your loins with truth and so on. It's just a reminder of the things that are essential if we're going to stand against the evil one. Uh, That uh, belt of truth in the first place. Once again we see the importance of God's word and the truth that is given there. And if we know the truth we will not get caught up with the lies of the evil one. We'll know what is right and what is wrong. I think sometimes uh, as we've said so often... Uh, the church sometimes makes wrong emphasis and gets things completely out, out of sync. Uh, just in writing uh, the bulletin with Dave taking a sabbatical, uh, one of the things I put in was that there is a church in London where obviously people have been encouraged to, to take out loans, uh, particularly to finance the church in all its extravagance. Pastors uh, driving around in Rolls Royces and living in a a mansion. I think my preaching must be wrong in some way. Uh, Maybe they've got something. But the fact is that these people, so often they're encouraged to give sacrificially that they will get back a hundredfold. Now many of them are in severe debt so that they cannot repay. And it shows that wrong teaching brings about, uh, well... Wrong behavior, wrong conduct. And when we get things out of balance, it's not always that we're teaching something that is completely wrong. After all, God does bless. He does cause us sometimes to prosper. He does watch over us and help us. But the whole thing is out of sync because they're laying up treasure on earth rather than treasure in heaven. 
which is one of the things that Jesus emphasized. So it's very important that we have that belt of truth. The breastplate of righteousness for a start as well. That uh, if we allow unrighteousness in our lives, Satan's got a loophole. I remember my mum saying to me when I was a kid and I used to tell a lie, you tell one lie and you have to tell another. And so often that's the case. Because we're having to cover up again and again the things that we have done. Again, we might remember just earlier in Ephesians, Paul tells us not to let the sun go down on our wrath. So that Satan will not have a loophole. The trouble is, when we allow anger to get out of control, it can turn to bitterness and resentment and create all sorts of problems. Of course, if that anger is completely out of control, it can lead to murder. So we need to make sure that we give no opening for Satan, that that breastplate of righteousness that we receive by faith when we come to know the Lord Jesus Christ, that is kept in good repair, so that when we do sin, we confess that sin and put it right. And seek to walk in a right way again. And of course we could go on with the other things. The the, uh, shield of faith. Satan will bring his lies into our lives. So often he is the accuser of the brethren. He can discourage us because we fail sometimes. But again we can assure ourselves that when we confess our sin. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin. And cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In other ways too we have to use that shield of faith. Of course, we should always be on the march for the gospel. Our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. We ought always to continue to pray, as the Apostle Paul says here, so that we might stand firm in the evil day. And surely some of the things that we've been looking at about the Antichrist, this man of lawlessness coming, it's an evil day. And when we think of some of the things that we've been looking at in Revelation, And I suppose in some ways we're getting a glimpse of with this uh, coronavirus. We can see how easily the whole world can be plunged into uh, times of tribulation. Well, we need to be able to stand firm. And we need, therefore, that knowledge of the Word of God. And linked with that very much is an attitude, of course, that we have to stand firm, that we're ready for the battle. But equally, as we've really already been saying, that we need to hold fast to the traditions, as Paul says here. So then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught, whether by word of mouth or by letter from us. I sometimes get a little bit concerned about this word tradition, because so often the church has brought its traditions which are contrary to the word of God. But Paul is talking here about the things that they have learnt as far as uh, the the word of God is concerned. The the word uh, paradosis really means to hand on in turn. And what he's saying in effect is that the teaching that you've received, whether by letter or when we were present and we taught you, those things you need to pass on now to others. Hold fast to those traditions yourself. But you have to pass them on. It's one reason why right down the ages we're still passing on the truth of God. And uh, that word is used in, uh, in a few places. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 concerning the, the breaking of bread. And uh, Paul talks about the tradition which I've received. There in uh, verse uh, 23. Or as it says here, for I received from the Lord. And that word received is the same idea. He's received this tradition. It's, it's basically the, uh, the verb from which this word uh, tradition comes from. He's saying, I've received this and I'm passing it on to you. And uh, going back to verse 2. Uh, now I praise you because you remember me in everything and hold firmly to the traditions just as I deliver them to you. So he's talking about the things that he himself has received regarding the Lord's Supper, as we've seen. And uh, in chapter 15 as well, again, it's the word that uh, he delivered to you, but it's, uh, it's the verb from which we get this uh, word tradition, paradosis. He's saying there, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I received, that Christ died for our sins 
according to the scriptures. So Paul is saying, I've received this, now I'm passing it on to you. But it's not just some man-made tradition that the church seems to be very good at. But he's saying, I'm passing on to you what I received. This is truth. And of course it opens up the whole uh, teaching on the resurrection. And exactly what our resurrection bodies will be like at the end. So it's good to make sure that we have a full picture of all that God has revealed. So this is the first thing that uh, the Apostle Paul is saying. God has done so much for you. You've been loved of God. Uh, You've known salvation. You were called. You were saved. Uh, You've known the work of the Holy Spirit. And one day you'll be going to be glorified with Him. Because of that, make sure you hold fast. Don't get taken away. Make sure you hold fast too to the traditions that you were taught. To the teaching, to the Word of God. In fact, we might just remind ourselves that in Romans chapter uh, 16, if my memory serves me correctly, or is it 15 and uh, verse 17, anyway, I think it's 16, uh, that uh, he's saying there that we should note anyone who is teaching them contrary to the, the instruction that they've received and not to associate with them. In other words, those who teach heresy don't have anything to do with them. And if they are ignored in that way, he goes on to say that Satan will soon be crushed under your feet. So it's important that we hold fast in our, in our attitude and we hold fast to the word of God. So uh, really what we're saying is be resilient in battle and responsive to the word. There is a battle that we're involved in. Let's stand firm in that. Let's not be swayed by error. Let's be responsive to the word of God. So that's really verse uh, 15 uh, that we've dealt with. Then we come to something of a benediction there in uh, verses 16 and 17. He reminds us again of the love of God. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who has loved us And given us eternal comfort. God who has loved us. We saw last week that uh, in this uh, verse, he says we, uh, in verse 13, but we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord. In the first chapter, or rather the first letter, he said beloved by God. Now he's bringing the two together. He's saying that you were loved by God and you were loved by the Lord Jesus Christ. Actually, here he puts the Lord Jesus Christ first. Usually he puts God the Father first, recognizing perhaps something of the order in the Godhead. But here he's uh, just reversing the order because it's through Christ that they've come to know salvation, through his love. And of course, I don't need to tell you uh, that Scripture is very clear that God so loved the world That he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father has loved us. And he goes on to basically uh, encourage them and then to say may God help us in this. So this is just the beginning of that benediction. But we ought to always remember that we're loved by God. And particularly when we're going through those struggles in life. And perhaps some of those battles that we will have to face in the future. That God has set his love upon us. To such an extent that Jesus died for us. And we ought to always meditate on the height and length and breadth and depth of that love of God. Although as the Apostle Paul said it's beyond understanding. One day I guess we'll understand the... The scope of God's immense love for us. But probably we need to meditate on that much more. Especially when we know something of those battles. And then he talks about uh, that eternal comfort. Who has loved us and given us eternal comfort. Again uh, the word uh, for comfort is uh, parakisis. And uh, we've often referred to this uh, parakisis. Uh, para, um, 
kaleo is the, the, the verb which basically means one who is called alongside. And uh, this is what we receive when one has come alongside. That's the meaning of the paraclesis. Here it's described as comfort. Uh, but we can think of all sorts of ways in which because God has come alongside us, especially in the Holy Spirit, uh, uh, the difference that that can make. When Jesus talked about the comfort of coming, of course he was saying that he was going to leave them. And they were obviously concerned about that. Here was their teacher, their master, the one who had instructed them so much and done so many miracles. Now he was going to leave. They felt bereft by the very thought of that. But Jesus was able to say, I will send another comforter, another one who will be alongside of you, who you can call alongside of you. And we might remind ourselves of the importance of being filled or baptized in the Holy Spirit. So that basically we're opening our lives fully to the Holy Spirit who comes alongside of us in every situation. Uh, that word is often translated as comfort, but it can be translated as, uh, uh, as help. Or uh, even that uh, the comforter can be described as the advocate. That very word is some, uh, once translated in John's uh, letter as advocate. Somebody who's there in the law court with us. You may remember that Jesus said that... Uh, they would be persecuted and uh, brought before the courts. Um, many of them were, of course. Paul himself was. But Jesus said, don't take any thought in advance of what you should say. Because the Holy Spirit will, will show you what to say. He's the advocate in the law court with us. And in other situations when we're witnessing, we don't always know what to say to people. We may have all sorts of schemes to equip, uh, equip people, to train people. But in the end, the most effective thing is what the Holy Spirit gives us to say. Because we don't know the sort of questions or the arguments that people will put up. But the Holy Spirit, because He is part of the Godhead, knows exactly the right answer. The trouble is that so often we try to work it out for ourselves rather than calling upon him who will come alongside of us. I don't know if you uh, saw on uh, television on uh, Friday night, I think it was uh, about uh, school children. Um, I've forgotten the, just uh, the, the term that was being used, but for their well-being, there would be people who, other children, who would help them with their difficulties, whether it was bullying or, bullying or anything else. Well, I'm not sure that they were necessarily the best people to be called alongside. But you know how you feel sometimes when you're facing a very difficult situation. And perhaps somebody comes alongside and gives some advice or praise with you. They're there to help you. And it brings comfort to us. Well, that's the very idea that is here. We as Christians, because God loved us, will give us that comfort will give us that one to stand alongside and to help us in the battle. I think, uh, again, Paul is thinking particularly of what has gone before. This Antichrist is going to come. He's going to cause a lot of trouble in the world. A lot of people will be deceived. Even some will fall away from the faith. And I'm afraid sometimes because of some of these false teaching that is given within the church... Some of the so-called saints will be caught up in this, uh, in this delusion. That's why we need to hold fast to the word. But again, we don't need to be over-anxious because we have a comforter with us. And he comes alongside as our teacher. He leads us into all truth. So that as we open up the scriptures, we can say, Lord, will you help us to understand? We might even say, Lord... Uh, some folks on television, if you look at the God Channel, and I don't advise it, are teaching this. What is the truth, Lord? And we can find, just if we know the Word of God, the Holy Spirit is even able to remind us of certain scriptures that will keep us on track. And then he goes on to say that uh, our Lord Jesus Christ and God Himself who has loved us and given us eternal comfort and good hope by grace. Good hope by grace. 
A matter of grace reminds us that it's not something we deserve. None of us do. But we have hope because God has been gracious enough to bring us to a place where we can have that eternal hope as well as that eternal comfort. My mind went uh, to Romans here, uh, Romans chapter 8 and uh, verse 24, a uh, verse that we've referred to before, where Paul is uh, talking uh, uh, about uh, the suffering of this present age. And uh, he says, even creation is groaning and wants uh, to see an end of all that is happening. And when we think of uh, what we see within uh, nature, the cruelty really in the animal kingdom, uh, we can understand that even creation wants to see an end to it. And of course Isaiah had that picture uh, uh, of the wolf lying down with the lamb. Uh, not the lion there. The lion and the lamb appear in Revelation. It's the wolf there. Uh, but an animal that would normally devour a wolf. All creation is now at... Uh, did I say devour a wolf? Um, it's not the lamb that devours the wolf. The wolf devours the lamb. I better get it right way round. Uh, that's, that's what it is by nature. But now the whole of creation is put right. And Paul goes on to say that we're waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. Perhaps when you go to the doctor, you can particularly think that one day you will have the redemption of your body. Your body is set free from all the aches and pains and problems when we have that uh, new body. Have it, hallelujah. But he goes on to say, for in hope we have been saved. But hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance we wait eagerly for it. Hope is always a future thing, isn't it, really? Hope to see you next Saturday. Uh, hope to get so-and-so for your birthday or whatever it might be. It's something that is yet to be realized that you're looking forward to. And here is the Apostle Paul really talking about that certain hope that we will have one day. But it's still in the future of our whole lives being transformed, our whole bodies transformed, a completely new world. And that hope we have by grace And it's only because we come to know the Lord Jesus Christ that we have that hope of eternal life for a start. That we have that hope of inheriting the kingdom. That we have that hope of a new earth and new heaven in which dwells righteousness. It's all because Jesus came and paid that penalty for sin. It's all by grace. You cannot earn it. No matter what you do. You might be a millionaire like... um, Trying to think of the bloke who does the um, um, computers and so on. Uh, Bill Gates, yeah. Giving away his money. Uh, Well, he's got enough. He doesn't miss it anyway. But he might give it all away and change all sorts of situations. He will still not earn his salvation. Because he's already guilty, as I was saying last week. But there it is. We we have this tremendous hope uh, of a new world. And our lives completely changed. Thank God they have already been changed. And you may remember that in Hebrews, uh, Paul talks about there that Jesus has gone before. That in him we have that hope. That uh, sure and certain hope is an anchor for the soul. Thank God. So because he has blazed the way for us, because he's gone to prepare a place for us, we all have that hope. Whether it's the hope of going to be with him when we die, or that hope of being with him when he returns here on earth. We all have that hope, but it's only by grace, not by our own effort. And then uh, he talks about, uh, may uh, God uh, comfort and strengthen your hearts in every good work and deed. Well, we've already thought of what that means by comfort. Uh, God does comfort us. He gives us that eternal comfort. Because God is with us. He's loved us and he's given us his Holy Spirit. So in every situation, God is there to help us. But he also talks about strength in your hearts. Actually, the word there means to, to make to stand. Some translations have established. 
So God is able to make us stand. He's already told us to, to, to stand for him. And hold on to that, uh, uh, that hope. Hold on to the traditions. But now it's saying that God is able to make you to stand. It's not our own effort. We have to apply uh, our effort to make sure that we do stand firm. But God is there helping us. Again, the Holy Spirit is there to strengthen us. It's part of His ministry in our own lives. So we have that, uh, that combination of doing our part, playing our part. But at the same time, we have that work of God in our lives. And it goes on to say uh, about comfort and strength in you in every good work and word. The things that we do day by day, the sort of deeds that we do, uh, the work that we do, do for the Lord particularly. Uh, we may feel that uh, there's not much we can do. Well, even in praying, you know, people who are conf uh, confined to their homes uh, very often say there's nothing I can do now really, but I can pray. Well, I don't think we should put it on the bottom rung, as it were. Uh, I think uh, prayer is the most important thing. And uh, we need to persevere in prayer. But equally, uh, we may find ourselves uh, being prompted by the Lord to do something, to call upon somebody who may be in need and so on. And uh, just again, it's a work of God. Uh, to encourage and minister to them. Uh, but equally, of course, uh, that uh, there are times when we have that opportunity to witness for him. And uh, some find it difficult. Uh, some perhaps are uh, very reticent. Uh, maybe they feel a bit shy and intimidated. But again, God is able to help us. He's able to strengthen us. He's able to, to make us stand even when perhaps we would uh, yield to the pressures that others would put upon us. So this is Paul's prayer for them. He's talked about the response they may need to make, but he's saying, now God is able to do this for you. In this uh, last uh, slide I've put up, I, am, I hold and I am held. Spurgeon's motto is, a tenio a tenior. And uh, I've got um, a plaque at home, which I got when I was at Spurgeon's College. They've uh, cha changed the uh, style and the motto somewhat. But, it's, well, the motto is still the same. I hold and I am held. And that's the right thing. We need to hold on. But thank God we're held. It's a two-way thing. Really, we should say, play your part, and God will play his part. We've said before that sometimes people get things out of, out of sync. You know, it seems that in the Christian church we either stress the whole of God's sovereignty, election, and, and you haven't got any choice. Grace is in, irresistible, as Calvin tried to say, which I don't think really uh, squares with Scripture. Or we've got those on the other hand who say it, it, it's all by free choice. God has given us free choice. Well, the fact is, it's both. God's sovereignty and without God's divine work in our lives, without Him working uh, 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 and saving us, and without Him keeping us, we wouldn't get anywhere. But we've got our part to play. First of all, it's a command, uh, in one sense, to obey the gospel. That's what uh, phrase occurs several times. I always thought it should be believe the gospel, but it's obey the gospel. And as I've said before, it's a matter, first of all, that uh, we need to repent and be baptized or believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. All of those are commands in many ways. So we need to respond. But God is drawing us. And thank God there is that combination of both. As I was uh, thinking about this further, I thought of those words of uh, Paul in uh, if, um, Philippians 3. In Philippians 3, he says that, um, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. This is verse 10, being conformed to his death. All of which was really something of his uh, conversion experience because he came to know Jesus. He came to know something of the power of the resurrection. That he was raised from his trespasses and sins and made alive in Christ. 
But we do share in his fellow, uh, fellowship of his sufferings. There is a cost in following Jesus. And being conformed to his death, we have to take up our cross uh, uh, and die to self. But he says, in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead, not that I have already obtained or have already become perfect, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which I was laid hold of by Christ. So he's saying, I want to take hold of what God has for me, but God took hold of me for a divine purpose. So he's saying, I want to really grasp what God has for me, but God has grasped me. The two coming together. I want to ask you again this morning, are you really fulfilling what God had for your life? You need to make sure that you do take hold of that. Even if it's only to encourage other believers. That's a very important thing. Or to show sympathy sometimes when people are going through it. So that you come alongside of them. As well as the Holy Spirit wanting to come alongside of them. And that you comfort them and strengthen them. That's an important part that all of us can play. Or again, as we've been already saying, that Jesus took hold of us that we might be a witness for him. So are you fulfilling what God has for your life? God has taken hold of you with a divine purpose. And thank God too that we can encourage ourselves and strengthen ourselves as uh, this particular or these verses would help us understand this morning. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who has loved us and given us eternal comfort and good hope by grace comfort and strengthen your hearts in every good work and word. Well may God help us in that.